All right, guys, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Now, the truth of the matter is we, <laughs> we could probably spend weeks in Hebrews chapter 10, but what I want to do today at the end of this day is I, I want us to look at some verses together, and what we're going to see is kind of a, a rehash of some of the things we've already talked about in order to get to what we're going to kind of end this thing with today, and that is the promise. So far, we've looked at assurance and sanctification from the foundation, which is Christ alone. We've also looked at the process, right, where we're living imperfect, right, in this world, but faithful to God. And so today, as we end, we're going to talk about the promise, now, I know I said this at the beginning, but really as I started looking at this, the issue of assurance and sanctification and studying for these sermons and all of those things and reading, and the thing that became most evident to me is how uncomplicated of an issue that God has shown us when it comes to living our life for His glory and honor and for us to experience what it means to have true assurance, true hope in everything that God has delivered to us and the promises that he's given to us. And today, if you believe that Christ is who he says he is, and if you believe he's accomplished everything the Bible says he has, then you will want to live for him. But only if you believe those other two things are true. The only way that the desire of your heart is going to be transformed, the only way you're going to long to know Jesus more, to make his name great, is if you've truly been transformed by the gospel. If your life has been changed, if you've been made new. All of that while understanding that as you live and move and breathe in this world, that you're not going to nail it. You're not going to be perfect in the way that you live your life. In fact, God's expectation for you is not perfection. God's expectation for you is faithfulness. God knows you. God knew how broken you were when he saved you. God knew how broken you were when he would send his son as the perfect sacrifice for sin. God already knew the mess you were. And the beauty of Christ Jesus and his work applied to our lives is that when the Father looks on us as believers in Jesus, he does not see a broken sinner. He sees a reflection of his son. He sees the perfect sacrifice of Christ. He sees holiness and righteousness And all of this is true. All of it is true. Because it rests ultimately in the character of God and the promises of God. And for us as Christians, resting in the promises of God is something that is a core tenet of our faith. There's a lot of things that God has said to us that we'll have peace beyond all understanding, that we can have confidence in this life, all of these assurances that God gives to us, but we're existing still within the presence of sin, so we don't realize, at least fully, a lot of these things, but, but by faith, we believe that they are absolutely true. And as Christians, a part of us resting in the promises of, of God is believing that the Bible itself is true that the book from which we get all of these promises is absolutely 100% true. And so that involves us having faith in the reliability and truthfulness of the Scripture. And of course, that comes back to, do we believe that God is as faithful as the Bible presents Him to be? Do we believe that God is immeasurably faithful? perfectly faithful. Do we believe that? 
Because the Bible tells us that that is true of God. In Numbers 23, verse 19, God is not human, that he should lie, not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and, not act, and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Well, the answer is, of course, God doesn't lie. Of course, when God makes a promise, he keeps that promise. And so for us, Today, this last session is really, we've talked about sanctification, we've seen assurance within that sanctification, but, but this last session is really about nailing down the assurance part, the hope part of this. Because resting in the promises of God is what brings peace to us that surpasses all understanding. Resting in the promises of God are what allow us to look at the chaos of life and the chaos of this world and say, things are going to be just fine. Because the world doesn't own the moment. The world doesn't make things happen. The world isn't responsible for my salvation and my peace. All of that rests in my creator, in my king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who's sovereign over all of it. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, because of who God is, the promises that he's made, we don't have to be anxious about anything. But in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, we present our request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Trusting in God's promises provides us with strength and endurance in this world. Romans chapter 8, Paul assures us that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. You know who that is? Christians, every single one of us. God loves us. We've been called according to his purpose. And so the scripture tells us that all things work together for good. And in the Greek, all things means all things. It means everything. It means the good, the bad, the ugly. All of it works together for our good. Well, how can that be true? Because everything about us rests on the work and the person of the Lord Jesus. That's how it's true. And listen to this. 2 Corinthians says this in chapter 1. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen, that means so be it, is spoken by us to the glory of God. Paul says to the Corinthian church that when it comes to the promises that God has made, the answer is always yes. So when God makes a promise, he keeps a promise. And so Paul says to them, when we make a proclamation of the promises of God, our response is amen. Our response to the promises that God has made is so be it because it will be done. It's faith in the completed work of Christ that drives us to certainty, complete certainty and dependability on the promises that God has made. And because of that, the promises that God has made to us as Christians in this world, it shapes the way that we perceive the world. It shapes the way that you look at your friends and your family. It shapes the way you look at conflict in the world and justice in the world and mercy in the world. It shapes the way we navigate this life. It provides us with the foundation for the assurance that we have, the hope that we have. And so I want to read for us eight verses-ish in Hebrews chapter 10. And then, of course, I'll pray for us and then we'll talk about it. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 10. It says this, and by that will, we'll talk about what that will is in a minute, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Let me pray for us and we'll talk about these verses today. Father, again, we trust in you and your word. I pray, Father, that as we look to your scripture that we would see the hope that we can have not just through the sacrifice of Christ and the person of Christ, but also in the promises that you have made to us through your word. May we receive the truth today with open hearts and open minds, and may we respond to your glory and your honor in the way that we apply the Scripture to our life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this passage in the book of Hebrews is situated, if you don't know anything about the book of Hebrews, it's literally a book that is just magnifying the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. I mean, that is Hebrews in a nutshell. And in this specific text in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews is is magnifying the sacrifice of Jesus by showing it in relationship to the Old Testament sacrificial system. And I'm hoping that as we work through this text in just a minute, that by the time we get to the end of it, that you're going to understand really why we can have the promises or why we can look at the promises we have in Christ Jesus and have this sort of unwavering assurance, this hope that is unshakable by the world. So let's start verse 10. Verse 10 right off the bat, by that will. What is that will? Well, it's the divine will of God. It's the purpose of that God has in all things, specifically here in the context of the sacrifice of Christ. I don't know if you understand this or not, but Jesus did not die on the cross because of some guy's plan. It wasn't the scribes and the Pharisees. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't Caiaphas. It wasn't any of those folks who made or walked Jesus to the cross. It was the divine plan of God that he should come and be the suffering servant who would die for the sins of the world. Satan did not send Jesus to the cross. Jesus willingly went to the cross in fulfillment of the Father's divine will. So everything about Jesus' sacrifice is in accordance with the plan of God. There wasn't anything that happened that took God by surprise. All of it ordained before the foundation of the world. And in this text, the writer of Hebrews says that by that will, that same will, the divine will of God, we have been sanctified. The sacrifice of Christ has sanctified us. And like we said before, that means we've been set apart. We've been made holy. And that is a reality in the life of a believer the moment that you experience genuine saving faith. In fact, here, this word sanctified, it means being made permanently holy. It means permanently holy. Think about that for a second. God didn't save you and kind of make you holy, 
that kind of leave you worldly. The picture here, like we've been talking about all weekend, is that the sacrifice of Christ was enough. It was sufficient to accomplish the work that God intended it to accomplish. The salvation of sinners and the sanctification of the same. One sacrifice at one moment in time provided believers in Jesus with sanctification and holiness for all time. That's incredible. That's an incredible picture of the extent of the cross of Christ. And a very real part of our faith is believing in that promise. When your life devolves into hell on earth, it's us clinging to the promise that at Calvary, I was sanctified. At Calvary, I was made holy. I was made a co-heir with Christ. I was adopted into the family of God. But again, that's positional sanctification, right? Our standing before the Father as Christ's work is applied to our life, but we still got to live on this side of eternity in the presence of sin, the reality of sin. And so as Christians, we live in this world still confessing sin, even though our sin is forgiven. At one moment, the moment we put our faith in Jesus, our sin forgiven. But we continually go before the Father, repenting of the, the sin that we're involved in in our own life. We do that on purpose to preach the gospel to ourselves, to remind ourselves of exactly what Christ accomplished, to encourage us to go and live in light of it. I like John MacArthur, and he says that. It's God's will that our practice match our position. That our experiential sanctification and our positional sanctification come together. That's good stuff, right? That we know who we are before the Father and the way that we live our life should match that. I mean, that makes sense, right? We don't want to be hypocrites in this world. And what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here in this promise of sanctification is that it's already accomplished. Well, how do we know? It's through the offering of the body of uh, Jesus Christ once for all. Right, so at, at, at every level, our sanctification is accomplished. We're just living in light of it, right? Now, for the glory and honor of God, imperfect yet faithful, but the picture here is that as Jesus offers his body, he offers to the glory of God a perfect sacrifice. A sacrifice that would sanctify us and reconcile us to God. And that's a done deal. It's already done. It's already done. And so there's an unmatched completeness and finality when it comes to the sacrifice of Christ. Because unlike all the animals in the Old Testament that were being sacrificed every day or every year, year after year, Jesus was the only sacrifice offered once for all time. Meaning for us that there is complete assurance in the eternal redemption of believers. If you're a believer in this room, you can rest assured in the sacrifice of Christ. It was once for all. And it's through his offering on the cross that we are sanctified, we're made holy, which is a fulfillment of God's plan of redemption once and for all. 
And he says in verse 11, the writer of Hebrews, and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. So the writer of Hebrews says these repeated sacrifices by these Levitical priests in the Old Testament had zero eternal weight when compared to the once and for all sacrifice of Christ. He says these daily sacrifices that are being made in the tabernacle and the temple, as they stood there daily as a part of their service, no matter how dedicated they were, how how much they thought of the ritual of it or anything like that, there is nothing that their sacrifices could do that would permanently take away sin. Instead, their sacrifices were just a reminder, a daily reminder of their inability to fully pay the sin debt that is owed to God. A reminder to them that no matter the symbolic value or the temporary value that this sacrifice made to bring some sort of purity, there was no animal sacrifice that could bring forgiveness and reconciliation to God like the perfect Lamb of God. And their limitations were a constant reminder to them that there needed to be a better sacrifice, that there needed to be a perfect sacrifice that could really address the root of this sin problem. And so in contrast to these ongoing sacrifices by these Levitical priests, the writer points us to that moment to this singular, complete sacrifice in the Lord Jesus, where he offers himself as this once and for all perfect Lamb of God that would purchase our redemption, that would be and fulfill the righteous requirement of God's divine justice that would provide for us as Christians eternal redemption. And the sacrifice of Christ for all time, that before the foundation of the world, God had a plan. And His plan was always that Christ would come and be the perfect sacrifice for sin. that that Christ would be enough and his sacrifice would be enough. And that the sacrifice of Christ would stand above these temporary sacrifices, these human offerings. In following his perfect sacrifice, the Bible says to us, he sat down at the right hand of God. This imagery of sitting down at the right hand of God shows us a couple of things. The exaltation of Christ, that he is indeed God, that he reigns in victory. But it is also a proclamation to us of the fulfillment of God's plan. It echoes the same sort of message that we see when Christ at the cross cries out, it is finished. It's done. It's complete. So Christ offering himself as a once and for all sacrifice is the ultimate solution to mankind's sin problem. The sacrifice of Christ is what brings to us, to the world, complete forgiveness and complete reconciliation with God. And listen to what the next verse says. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool. Listen, I know that all the enemies of God weren't present at the cross, but all the enemies of God believe that the cross of Christ was a victory. The problem is, is they believe it was a victory for them, 
but we know the truth. That at the cross, there was a victory, but it was God's victory. That as all the enemies of God gathered together, inflicting what is the worst punishment, right, death, they thought it was going to be a good day for them. But at the cross, Jesus dies, and of course, recently we celebrated this, he got up, right? He was resurrected from the dead. And so Jesus defeats death, the, the greatest enemy to humanity. He defeats death. He conquers death for us. And listen to this promise. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. So through the sacrifice of Christ, this once and for all sacrifice, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's a promise. That in the sacrifice of Christ, in light of everything else accomplished at the cross, one of the accomplishments of the cross is that he's perfected us. He's perfected those who are being sanctified. And it doesn't mean moral perfection. It doesn't mean that God is, has made us flawless in our behavior. It means that at the cross, God completed and fulfilled a process. Through his sacrifice, he accomplished the full and final forgiveness of sins for believers. When you put your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven of sin, all sin, past, present, future. And if you're a Christian in this room right now, you are just as forgiven right now as you will be when you're standing face to face with Christ in eternity. You're just as forgiven. God has made a declaration over your life. Romans tells us he's made a declaration over our lives of righteous, complete in his sight. And it's not because of anything we've done. It's not because of our good works or what we're able to accomplish. Again, it's because of what Christ has done in our union with him by faith. And so when it's talking about those who are being sanctified, it's talking about everything that we've talked about this weekend. Specifically about this experiential sanctification where we're every day, right, living our lives for the glory and honor of God, being fashioned more and more into the image of Christ. And it's Christ's sacrifice that provides the foundation for it all. It's Christ who is transforming us. Christ who is equipping us to live for his glory and honor. It's Christ. It's his work. It's him. He's the one that all of this hinges on. And we believe that by faith. And the Bible says to us here in Hebrews that Christ has perfected us by a sacrifice. By a sacrifice, our sins are completely forgiven. And we've been declared holy and righteous before God. And yet at the same time, we're constantly growing, constantly becoming more and more like Christ in our character and in the way that we live. Gospel transformed people live in gospel transformed. And the promise that we have in Hebrews 10, it culminates in verse 14. But it's the fulfillment of a promise that God made. So yes, that is a promise that we've been perfected. But it's part of a greater promise that God has made to us in the fulfillment of a new covenant. Verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for 
after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws in their heart and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. The writer of Hebrews says to us that the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to the truth of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit is the testimony, the guarantee of the promises that God has made to us when it comes to salvation and forgiveness. The Holy Spirit and His power as He indwells us, that is our assurance. He is our assurance. And the writer of Hebrews talks about the prophecy given to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, where God promises to establish a new covenant with his people. Talking about after the coming of the Messiah, they would establish this new covenant. And in that new covenant, God is writing the law on our hearts and our minds. What does that mean? That means that God is equipping you to live your life for his glory and honor. Because you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You have the law of God written on your hearts and your mind. When you go out there, you know how to bring glory and honor to God. It's a matter of whether you're going to do it or not. Whether you believe this is true. Whether you believe that God has changed you and equipped you to make those sorts of decisions. It's a matter of whether you believe any of it's true. But regardless of whether you believe it's true or not, I do, and I know that at the end of the day, the promise will stand. That God has established a new covenant with us where we have been transformed in our very being. We have been made new in our inner person, in our spirit, where we can actually go out and live in obedience to the commands of God. And that becomes a natural outflowing of what God has already done in us. We don't have to force the matter. It's not like, oh, shucks, well, I guess I got to go try to live for the glory and honor of God. No, when God changes you, when God saves you, the natural desire of your heart is that you want to do everything to bring glory and honor to him. You want to live in obedience to God, even when it's hard. And in the new covenant, the laws of God are internalized in our hearts and our minds through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And we're equipped to live from the inside out for the glory and honor of God. That's sanctification. And let's talk about this promise because it's probably, in my opinion, one of the most incredible promises in all of Scripture. The sins and lawless deeds of his people he remembers no more. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. God isn't sitting in heaven pointing his finger at you saying, ooh, I saw that. Ooh, I, I can't believe Johnny did that. When the sacrifice of Christ is applied to our lives by faith, it means complete forgiveness of sins and the remission of, of your sins under the new covenant. It means that God is not holding that against you anymore. God isn't looking at you like an angry parent and you've just messed up. God is looking at you through the lens of his perfect son. He's looking at you as forgiven. Not as a sinner, but as a saint, holy, blameless. 
God isn't sitting there waiting on you to mess up. God already knows you've been bought with a price. And the payment that God's wrath and judgment received was sufficient. It was enough. And so through the atoning sacrifice, Jesus provides full and final redemption. You are reconciled to God. The barrier of sin that once separated you from God is gone forever. And there's nothing that you can do or anybody else can do that can put that barrier in place. When God saves, he saves. And all of this is assured to us when we look at our lives and see the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He's the guarantee. In the new covenant, we have complete forgiveness of sins and the assurance of God's unfailing love and mercy, a promise that we rest in. And we're going to end with verse 18. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Understand this. The Bible says to us that the sacrifice of Christ was enough. That we are fully and completely forgiven. And there is nothing more that you can add. When you mess up, you take it before God and you lay it at his feet. And you get up and keep running the race that God has set before you. And then you fall again. You lay it before God and you get up up and you keep running the race that God has set before you. Sanctification, assurance, holiness, and hope are manifest in our life by the way that we run the race that God has set before us. Faith is belief that drives us to action, that drives us to live for the glory and honor of God. Understanding that in all of this, that Christ is enough. There's nothing else. There's no longer an offering for sin. There's nothing more that you can do except going and living for the glory and honor of God. Imperfectly faithful. That's it. It's not complicated. In fact, it's not even hard. It's not really that hard to do. The hardest part is the presence and the reality of sin. we got to deal with that. That's the hard part. But the truth of the matter is, running the race that God has set before you is not hard. It matters if you believe this or not. But if you don't believe it, it's going to be hard. Because you're running after something you don't believe in. And so you're going to be doing your thing. The world is going to come in and you're going to go your own way. But if you have genuine saving faith, just run. And by that faith, believe that God has got this thing because the promise of Scripture is that He does. He always has and He always will. And the truth of the matter, we already know how this thing's going to pan out. We win. We win. Because of what Christ has done. Because of the promises, because we know. We know what awaits us on the other side. We know. And so we run. And so we run. And what we've talked about this weekend aren't just words on a page in a book. All of this is the promise of God. We have assurance and sanctification built on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know the process. We know it's going to be ugly. We know that we're going to fall down, but we know that we can get back up again and keep running and be just as faithful as the moment we fell. We can always do that because we're forgiven. We're forgiven. 
There's no more offering. There's, not, there's nothing else we can do except have faith in the sacrifice that Christ has already made. And at the end of the day, what this all boils down to, whether you're going to live with hope and holiness, it boils down to if you believe the promises are true. And that's something you have to figure out in your own life. Nobody in this room can figure that out for you except you. Do you believe in this gospel that we proclaim? That radically transforms us, that makes us new, that equips us to live for the glory and honor of God. Do you believe that? If you do, go and live in light of it. If you don't, start. (laughs) If you don't, hopefully the Lord will move in your heart, draw you to himself so that you can run this race that is set before you, run and live this life to the glory and honor of God. I'm going to pray for us. I'm done. That's it. I'm going to pray for us. We'll continue in our time together. Father, we thank you that you're a God we can trust in. We thank you for the promises that you've made, knowing that you'll keep them. And Father, I just pray for myself, for everyone in this room, young people and adult alike, that we would understand the depth and the magnificence of you, of the gospel, of the work of the gospel and what it truly accomplishes in our life. Yes, we're saved, but we're forgiven. We have peace, we have joy, we have hope. When you look at us, you don't see who we were, but who we are in Christ, holy and righteous. May we bring glory and honor to you by living in light of that every day and every moment that you entrust to us on this side of eternity. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity to be here and look to your word. Pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.